It's been a beautiful week, hasn't it? Have you enjoyed this week? Uh, especially the end of this week. It's nice to see the sun again, to get outside and enjoy the beauty of God's creation. One of my family's favorite things to do is to go on walks, especially at beautiful places like the Bellevue Botanical Gardens or Seward Park or Kulan or Kubota Gardens. How many of you have been to Kubota Gardens? Raise your hand if you've been there. You know, more of you should go. It's, it's, it's a beautiful place. This is a picture that Deb took. Uh, didn't take a lot of time and energy, just snapped a photo because it, it's just rich in color. And I like it because it's free. It's a free Japanese garden. <laughs> but it's beautiful. And it's just on the other side of Skyway, kind of tucked away. So if you didn't know you were looking for it, it'd be hard to see. There's actually a rock sticking up with the name of the garden on it, and it's easy just to drive right by it. Um, but I love the beauty of God's creation this time of year. I especially like one of our favorite things about this time of year are the new green leaves, the new growth that you see. Uh, it's, they're just so vibrant and beautiful. And what those green leaves tell us is that the tree is healthy. They say this is a healthy tree because... Healthy things grow. This principle is equally true when it comes to the church. By the way, who is the church? We are the church. Amen? That's us. That's us. So this principle is equally true for us. If we are healthy, we will grow. When you talk about church growth... A lot of times the focus automatically turns to numbers. If you talk to anyone about church growth, they think about, oh, well, are you growing in numbers? But though this is one sign of health in a church, it is not a foolproof sign. Uh, I was thinking, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about um, Jim Jones, the cult leader. Uh, he drew thousands of people to him, uh, wasn't necessarily healthy, um, so... Uh, Growth in numbers isn't always a foolproof sign. Even though there is some significance, there are far more significant signs of health in the church, like stronger marriages. That's a sign of growth. Children growing up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. New faces of people wanting to learn about Jesus. Freedom from addictions. Learning to love more sacrificially. If our church is healthy, we should see that kind of growth. And I appreciate one other sign of growth that I've mentioned. One of the areas, or I should say, maybe the key area that we've grown numbers-wise in our church in the 14 years I've been here, is we have grown in our ethnic diversity. In fact, now, we're not anywhere near the, uh, the 35 or 45 nations that Rick was mentioning in the churches in Dubai, but uh, a year or two ago, I counted up 15 different ethnicities or nationalities within our church. That's awesome, because that's a little glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. It's, it's a sign of health in our church when we're drawing from our neighborhood and we're seeing greater diversity that reflects our neighborhood. That's the kind of healthy growth we want to see. But true growth is transformative. Is your life being transformed spiritually? I mean, that's really the question. Because that is what Jesus wants to accomplish in our life. We call it spiritual formation. You may recognize that phrase from the backside of your bulletins because on the backside of the bulletins, we have a vision statement that looks an awful lot like this. The spiritual formation of kingdom-oriented people leading to a fully revitalized church. This is what we want for Renton Bible Church. The spiritual formation of kingdom-oriented people leading to a fully revitalized church. What we are talking about here is we want to thrive. 
That is what fully revitalized is all about. Vital, so we want to revitalize, comes from the word vital, which just means life. And it's talking about thriving. We want to thrive as a people. So question, are you thriving spiritually? Because you may be thriving in a bunch of other ways. You may be thriving occupationally or financially. You may be thriving in your recreational opportunities. But there is no kind of thriving as significant as thriving spiritually. Experiencing growth. We want to see God's hand at work in our body producing new growth. I want to see those bright green leaves here at Written Bible Church. And I do see them in little glimpses, but I want to see them all the more. And how do we get there? We get there through spiritual formation. Listen to one author's definition of what spiritual formation is. Christian spiritual formation is not simply fostering the experience of the Spirit, but rather a radical formation, a shaping and molding of the believer into conformity with Christ through the Spirit. A shaping and molding of the believer. That's what spiritual formation is all about. But he starts off by saying that spiritual formation isn't just experiencing the Spirit. Sadly, there are a lot of people who go to church driven by the desire for an experience. I Make me feel warm and fuzzy. There are a lot of churches that cater to that. And listen, I'm not against you having an experience at church, but if you're having spiritual experiences but not being spiritually formed, then something is wrong. Because God is not here just to give us experiences. He wants to form us, to transform us, to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. So here's my question for you. Do you want to thrive more spiritually? Do you want to experience greater radical formation that the Spirit longs to work in your life? Do you desire spiritual formation? We cannot make the assumption that because someone enters a church that the answer is yes. The truth is, genuine spiritual formation is costly. I know, that's not what I'm supposed to say, is it? You know, when a salesman is making a sales pitch, they're supposed to say, oh, it's easy and it's cheap. Listen, believers, to grow in Christ is hard and it's costly. There is nothing easy or cheap about it. However, I believe that it's not only the life that Jesus Christ called us to, but it is the best life. I may be be conflicting with books out there that tell you other definitions of what the best life is. But let me tell you, the best life is a life that is being constantly conformed, transformed, changed more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. Radical formation is what Jesus calls us to. Maybe you've wondered, why does the pastor challenge me to come to fellowship events after church? Why does he do that? I'm just happy to show up in the service and go home. Why does he do? Or, or why does the pastor call us and say, hey, come to work days? Why does the pastor say, come to an invite challenge dialogue and talk about how you're doing it inviting? I don't, I don't want to worry about inviting. That's, that, that's tough stuff. I'd rather just go to church and, and get my spiritual fill. Why does the pastor challenge us to invite our neighbors or to get involved on life and life groups or to discipline ourselves to be in the word every day? Can't we just sing some songs, pray some prayers and call it good? Let me ask you this question. Did Jesus simply sing some songs, pray some prayers, and call it good? Or would you say that Jesus challenged his disciples? Which one was it? I would say it's the latter. 
I would say he was pretty challenging. In fact, if you read the Gospels, you see a lot of responses, both from the disciples and from those who are simply in earshot of Jesus, a lot of responses that are incredulous. They're saying, what did you say, Jesus? Eat your, eat your body and drink your blood? What? No, wait a second. What are you talking about? It's almost like Jesus did it on purpose to kind of shake the people up and wake them up and help them to see that there's more to life than just getting by. Jesus challenged the disciples not merely to be part-time followers, but to be his disciples, to be Christ followers, not to simply survive. He wanted them to thrive. And believers, that is what he wants for you and me. And honestly, that is what our current sermon series is all about, helping each and every one of us to thrive so that we can experience in greater measure the fruit of the Spirit. What we are talking about here, ultimately this Sunday, is the fruitful life. If you haven't already done so, I invite you to take your sermon outlines from your bulletins. If you didn't receive one of these, just raise your hand and Klaus will make sure and give you one. I also invite you to turn to Galatians chapter 5. Doesn't the fruitful life sound good to you? I mean, doesn't that sound nice? As I was preparing the sermon, a song came into my head, Ringo Starr, It Don't Come Easy. And believers, I got to tell you, experiencing growth in the fruit of the Spirit requires intentionality, it requires effort, it requires work. Well, wait a second, but hasn't Paul just gotten through saying in Galatians that salvation is not by works? Yes, it's true. We are saved by grace through faith, not by our effort. But Paul argues that if we are saved, it will reveal itself in spiritual formation, in a transformed life. And that is exactly what we will find today in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 26. Actually, I'm going to back up three verses. The three verses we finished two weeks ago, I'm going to back up to verse 16 so we see the whole passage in context. This is what we read, Galatians 5, 16 to 26. So I say... Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature or the flesh. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature or flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Now, you can see that Paul does not find any conflict in saying in the first half of Galatians, good works will not save you, for you are saved by grace. But then arguing in the second half of Galatians, if you have the Spirit, it will reveal itself in a transformed life, in good works. Grace and good works are not in opposition to each other, because good works are the fruit of grace. There are really two extremes when it comes to this topic. Some don't want to talk about works at all for fear that it's going to lead to legalism. Others want to make works a requirement for salvation, fearing that it will lead to licentious living. Isn't that a great word? Licentious. How many times have you used that word in the last week, right? But it just comes from the word license. You have a license to drive. Uh, some people feel they have a license to sin. Well, I'm forgiven, 
So I have a license to sin. I can just keep on doing it and it doesn't matter because I'm forgiven. Paul says in Romans 6, uh, 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 it's simply not true. Because if you have the Spirit of God in you, you have been transformed and you cannot go on living that way. You just can't. And so we're going to set aside the arguments, however, between legalism and licentious living. And we're going to focus on what Paul says, because really Paul refutes both extremes. We see this in the conclusion of the Bible Project video that summarizes Galatians, which we started a few weeks ago. You may have wondered, are we going to finish it? Well, we're, we're skipping the middle, and I'm just going to show you the very end of this Bible Project video. In this clip, the Jewish religious leaders ask Paul, how will non-Jews learn God's will without the laws? In other words, if we don't make these new Christians follow the Old Testament law, won't they just end up living in sin? Listen to this summary of Paul's answer. To learn this, Paul responds in chapters 5 and 6 by describing how Jesus' transforming presence through the Spirit is the key. The laws of the Torah are good. They're wise, Paul says. In fact, they can all be summarized, as Jesus did, in the command to love your neighbor as yourself. But the laws, good as they are, they did not give Israel the power to obey them. In contrast, the good news is that Jesus did fulfill the laws on our behalf, and now he lives in us through the Spirit, making his people into new humans who fulfill the law by loving others. So Paul goes on to contrast this old and new humanity. The habits of the old humanity are obvious. These are behaviors that dehumanize people, they destroy relationships and whole communities. And while the laws of the Torah prohibited these behaviors, Jesus actually put them to death on the cross. So when a person trusts in Jesus and lives in dependence on the Spirit, his life becomes theirs and produces what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. This is Jesus' way of life that he wants to reproduce in his family so that they become people of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But this fruit isn't automatic, Paul says. It requires cultivation just like real fruit. Or in his words, if we live by the Spirit, we have to keep in step with the Spirit. This requires intentionality. We have to learn how to prune off our old habits and cultivate new ones. And as we do so, we find ourselves carried along by the Spirit as Jesus reshapes our minds and hearts and makes us into people who love God and others. And in this way, Jesus' people fulfill what Paul calls the Torah of the Messiah. In the end, Paul concludes, this requirement for Christians to become Torah observant or be circumcised is an adventure in missing the point. What really matters is God's new creation, this new multi-ethnic family of the Messiah, people full of faith in Jesus who are learning to love God and others in the power of the Spirit. And that's what the letter to the Galatians is all about. Thank you, David and Bill. According to today's passage, and this was a great summary of what we're looking at today, Galatians 5, 19 through 26, the fruitful life teaches us to love God and love others in the power of the Spirit, but it refuses sinful patterns. As we saw in this little video, those are what was put to death on the cross. The fruitful Christian refuses and never excuses sinful patterns. We must remove from our vocabulary, the devil made me do it or no one's perfect, or I'm doing the best I can because the devil never made anyone do anything. And though it may be true that no one is perfect, not even once does Paul use this as an excuse for sin throughout his epistles or really anywhere in God's word. And I'm doing the best I can doesn't fly because God doesn't ask you to do the best you can. He asks you to do the best the Spirit can because the Spirit of God lives in you if you've embraced Christ as your Savior and have been forgiven of your sin through His death on the cross and now indwelt by His Holy Spirit. That 
is the source of the transformation. Not me trying harder, but me living by the Spirit and letting His life be lived through me. What sinful patterns does he say are not to be in the Christian's life? Well, he lists the first three there in verse 19. If you look, you see the first three sinful patterns that he says, these will not be a part of the life of the follower of Jesus. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery. These first three are sexual sins. Like Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun. Do you know that the same sexual sin that wreaked havoc 2,000 years ago in the early church wreaks havoc even today? Our culture is filled with conflicts over sexual sins, isn't it? I mean, what are all the arguments about and all the discussions and all the, all the, even the political movements are about sexual sin? What Paul says, however, is that sexual immorality is not to be a part of our lives. Paul says if you love Jesus, sexual morality is not even an option. And it has nothing to do with if it feels good, do it. Or as long as I'm not harming anyone, you've heard that one before, or I was born this way. All of these things have one thing in common. Do you know what all those arguments have in common? They are driven by the flesh, my sinful desires, and what I want personally. For the follower of Jesus, the question is not what I desire, but what God desires. Let me, let me just pause. Does that sound odd to you for anyone to be preaching a message that says what you desire is not tantamount? It's what God desires that matters the most. I mean, doesn't, that's a little, it's countercultural if you think about it. Because our culture says, I should be able to do whatever I want to do. The word of God says, no, <laughs> you were created by a creator who, get, who has designed you for a purpose and you need to live in accordance with His purpose. By the way, that's the best life. If you want the greatest blessings, that's the best life. But also, in addition to that, anything in opposition to that is sin. Anything that's opposed to God's design is sin. And Scripture makes absolutely clear that all sexual activity outside of marriage between one man and one woman is opposed to God's design and desires for His children. Now, if, if you have a problem with that, you need to know your problem is not with me. It isn't. It's with this book right here because it's really pretty clear. I mean, this isn't really something where we go, oh, well, you could go one way or the other. Well, if you don't want to treat this book with integrity, you can go one way or the other. But if you're going to let the book say what this book says, by the way, we call it the Holy Bible. Bible simply means book. It's a holy book. It's sacred, which means it's right. And when I have a conflict with this book, I'm wrong and it's right. This is what God's Word teaches. However, here's the interesting thing. Now we're going to switch gears. Ugh, can you feel, feel the grinding in the gears? Because here's the interesting thing about this passage of list of, of sins. It doesn't focus in this list on sexual morality. Those are only the first three. It makes the transition. And you know what the focus of sin is in this passage. It is sin related to our relationships with each other. That's what the focus... Look, look at this passage. You can see it here. Now, the first two, verse 20, are focused on sin related to our relationship with God, right? Idolatry and witchcraft. They negatively impact our relationship with God. The rest of those on the list negatively impact our relationship with others. And look again, just if you look at this list, they're, they're all about relationship, aren't they? Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, the list goes on. For too long in Christendom, we have obsessed over moral issues primarily for those outside of the church. Do you hear what I'm saying? For too long, we have focused our energies on pointing fingers at those outside the church, saying, oh, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. Don't get me wrong. I think it's good for us to, to declare what truth is, like I've done today. I think it's good to do that. But I think it's also good for us to acknowledge 
that the sins Paul focuses on are sins that we struggle with inside of the church. Like the saying goes, when you point at someone else, you have four fingers pointing back at you, right? And this is Paul's focus. The focus of the church is that we need to deal with the sin that we struggle with. We struggle with these things that he lists. Hatred is the first one he lists here in verse 20. Hatred is talking about hostility. Now, I don't like some of these. I prefer not hatred because I think it's for us easy to look at hatred and go, well, I don't hate anyone. The word here is just hostility. Do you ever get hostile at anyone because they've offended you? That's what he's talking about. The next word, discord, refers to strife or being quarrelsome. Something, according to F.F. F. Bruce, that Paul is especially concerned to keep out of his churches. Jealousy comes from the Greek word zealous. That's actually the Greek word zelos, which we translate zeal, right? Zeal can be good, can't it? Paul's talking about zeal when it's not good. He's talking about zeal for my agenda, my views, my will, and that can be very bad. Fits of rage is often excused with, well, sometimes I fly off the handle, uh, or it's just something I'm really passionate about. That's why I'm so mad. Uh, guess what? Those excuses don't work with Jesus. Uh, fits of rage are not acceptable according to what Paul says here. Selfish ambition results in contention when I don't get my way. Dissensions are the divisions that result from divisive talk and behavior. You know the little things we say that are negative about somebody else? We kind of cloak them sometime so they're not too obvious. Maybe even a prayer request. Lord, help, brother... No, no, no. If we are speaking against someone, causing dissension, Paul says it shouldn't happen. The next word, uh, let me see here, make sure that I'm... Factions. Factions. And do you know what the Greek word is behind factions? I never, I didn't know this until I studied this week. It's heresy. That's the Greek word, heresy. Now, when you think of heresy, you think of someone who has a bad doctrine, don't you? But Paul's not talking about doctrine here. He's talking about any kind of divisive teaching. Anything that's divisive. You, you could be right, speaking what's right, but if you do it in a divisive manner, it's heresy, according to Paul. And that's wrong. Verse 21 starts with envy, which is pretty self-explanatory. And the final two, drunkenness and orgies, describe a partying lifestyle that benefits no one. Once again, it's just focused on my selfish desires. Paul concludes with these very strong words, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let me ask you a question. Does that strike you a little funny? I mean, it's a little bit harsh. Like, Wait a second, Paul. What are you saying here? It's pretty heavy-handed. Surely you don't mean to suggest that people who tend to blow their lids once in a while or, or be argumentative or be overly vocal with others about their disputes or create conflicts and strife by insubmissive or unloving speech or behavior, you don't mean to say that those people can't get into heaven, do you? That's kind of what he just said. I mean, isn't that what he says here? I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But let's be clear about what he's not saying. He is not saying that if I have an angry outburst, I am therefore disqualified from heaven. Because if that's what he's saying, I'm not going to heaven. Right? Because I've had maybe an angry outburst here or there. And maybe some of you would say, yeah, okay, maybe I've done the same he is not saying that if I speak about someone behind their back that I've therefore committed the unpardonable sin. Pa Paul's point is not perfection. Paul's point is when we continue in such sinful patterns, refusing to repent. That's his issue. If we engage in such sinful patterns and refuse to repent. When someone comes to us and says, hey, this, this is not good. Or when God's word comes to us and says, hey, 
When we simply excuse it and refuse to repent, that's where the problem lies. And I think David is the greatest example. Do you remember what David was referred to in the, in the Old Testament? He's referred to as a man after God's own heart. Yes, David, who committed adultery, who had a man murdered. Wait a second, that doesn't sound like a man after God's own heart. But what made him a man after God's own heart? He repented. Psalm 51, right? I shared that this morning. By the way, you might think, well, Dad's really clever. He thought of Psalm... I, did, I, didn't, even, I didn't even put together starting us off with Psalm 51 this morning. Can you believe that? That's the Holy Spirit who put those together. But here's David committing terrible sins, but he repented. And believers, God is not saying that we need to be perfect. God is saying that we need to repent of our sin, and we need to turn to Him and seek help. It also must be clarified that Paul is not saying that entrance into the kingdom is based upon merit, so that if you mess up, you may need to say some Hail Marys or penance or spend extra time in purgatory. By the way, none of those doctrines are in Scripture. Such doctrines are not biblical. What Paul is advocating is that heaven is a gift that is given to us, but the Spirit who comes with that gift will change us and will cause us to live differently. It's not that avoiding these sin earns you merit to get into heaven. It is that if these sins are consistently in your life, they reveal that the Holy Spirit must not be. Right? Because when we commit sin like this, what do we do with the Holy Spirit? We grieve the Holy Spirit. And He's working in us to challenge us to convict the world of sin is one of His jobs, and He convicts us of sins. F.F. F. Bruce writes, While good deeds in themselves do not admit one to the kingdom, evil deeds of the type mentioned certainly exclude one. Again, not because they inherently disqualify us, but they reveal that we don't have the Holy Spirit working inside of us and we are not of him. Again, if anyone has an issue with, with this, strong teaching, but it, it's, it's Paul who teaches it. And I, this is the challenge I give you is don't water down what God's word says. See, this is a problem sometimes we get into with what's called systematic theology. We want to make everything fit my theology, and therefore we come to passages that are a little, well, what do I do with that? Oh, I'll just cram it. I'll, I'll reshape it a little bit so it fits. No, don't cram it. Don't make it fit. Let it be whatever it is. And if you can't, if it doesn't fit your theology, change your theology to reflect what the Word of God says. Nonetheless, Paul's plain and clear message is that the fruitful life refuses sinful patterns. But the fruitful life isn't only about what we don't do. It's about what we do do. We read in verses 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, does that list feel a little daunting to you? It should. I mean, it should feel a little daunting. However, I love what author Jerry Bridges says in this regard when he writes... This is an awesome list of character traits to pursue, and our first reaction, if we are realistic at all, is probably to say, I can't work on all of these. That is indeed true, if we were left to our own devices. But these traits are the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His work within us. This means not that we bear no responsibility for the development of Christian character, but rather that we fulfill our responsibility under His direction and by His enablement. So, question, how is it even possible? It is because of what we read in verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. In other words, the fruitful life embraces Christ in me. As Paul wrote earlier in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. 
In the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 is a great verse to memorize. Believers, our ability to exhibit this kind of fruit is not about our ability. It's about the ability of Christ who lives in us. It is not only his righteousness credited to our account that results in our forgiveness and reconciliation with God. It is his righteousness at work within us that results in our producing the fruit of righteousness. It wasn't only our guilt that was nailed to the cross in Christ, but our flesh with its passions and desires were nailed to the cross. I love this picture Paul gives us. The cross both reconciles and transforms. It's important to get that out there because too often we've fallen prey to the mentality that says, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. What? You're just a sinner saved by grace? No, 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 no. You are a sinner. I should say, I am a sinner saved by grace who is now therefore enabled to be a saint, a holy one in Christ Jesus. As the Bible Project put it just a few moments ago, through the Spirit, Jesus makes us into people who love God and others and fulfill the Torah or the law of Messiah. Okay, this all sounds well and good, but how is it even possible? How does this happen practically? Because I have to tell you that the fruit of the Spirit aren't always in abundance in the tree of my life. This brings us to the very important 25th verse of Galatians 5, which says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, the fruitful life cultivates a Spirit-led life. To keep in step with the Spirit means that we follow His lead in how we live out each and every day. I already mentioned that Debbie and I like going on walks. On occasion, we walk hand in hand. You ever do that? We walk hand in hand. And when we do that, Debbie does this funny little dance move uh, to get our feet aligned because she believes we don't. And I, I'm never really too, I don't know, I don't know. For some reason, it doesn't really concern me too much, but she'll always do this whole thing. She'll flip her feet so that we're walking together. And it, I just thought of this when, you know, keep in step with the Spirit. Are you walking in step with the Spirit? Do you need to flip your feet once in a while and go, okay, wait a second. Oh, you're going this. Okay, I need to do this because the Spirit's leading in this way. Are we walking by the Spirit? This is very much what Paul advocates here, that if we would live by the Spirit, we must let Him lead in our daily life, keeping in step with Him. What does that mean? One commentator writes, By exhorting his converts to be in line or keep in step with the Spirit, Paul is asking those who claim to live by the Spirit to evidence that fact by a lifestyle controlled by the Spirit. That he exhorts believers to do what it is the work of the Spirit to produce is typical of Paul's understanding of Christian ethics. For Paul never views the ethical activity of the believer apart from the Spirit's work, nor the Spirit's ethical direction and enablement apart from the believer's active expression of his or her faith. And just to boil it down, he's saying that it goes together. We are called to cultivate a life led by the Spirit, but it's the Spirit who empowers us to do that. It works together. How? I don't know. Except that I know that this is what we're taught to do and that we must live by the power of the Spirit, but it requires effort. It requires an active expression of our faith on a daily basis to let Him lead. We have a role to play in cultivating a Spirit-led life if we would experience the fruitful life. I really appreciate what Jerry Bridges has to say about this. And you may remember that he is the author of what became a classic, The Pursuit of Holiness. Great book. Um, he actually wrote recently, more recently, this book called The Fruitful Life which when I began to do the series, I didn't remember this, but I thought, oh, wait a second, I have a book on the fruit of the Spirit. That's probably a good resource to have. Um, and this is what he writes. He says, though the power for Christ-like character comes from Christ, the responsibility for developing and displaying that character is ours. This principle seems to be one of the most difficult for us to understand and apply. We need to learn that the Bible teaches both total responsibility 
and total dependence in all aspects of the Christian life. We are totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. We are totally responsible. They go together, as you see here in Paul's teaching. It is God who works in you, is what another passage says. It is God who works in you. Work out your salvation because it is God who works in you. So how do we fulfill that role? What does it look like to cultivate a spirit-led life? It's spring, and I've been working on my lawn again. I read an article in the paper a few weeks ago that was addressing this topic where the author advocates that if you want a good lawn, you need to go to some pretty significant lengths. Remove the moss, add new soil, fertilize, reseed, cover with peat moss, and water faithfully. Or, she said, you can just toss some seed and hope for the best. Honestly, I think a lot of us, when it comes to spiritual life, we go for the latter. We toss some seed and we hope for the best. The challenge that Paul gives us here is to be intentional and purposeful in growing by the Spirit. Don't just toss some seed. Go ahead and do that with your lawn because, frankly, who cares if that grows? But in the lawn of your life, cultivate it so that you are increasingly formed by the Spirit into the image of the Son. And so here's some tips for intentional cultivation. First of all, listen to Him. We are like... Oh, I'm going I'm to pass that up uh, because of time. It's funny, but not needed. Sorry, I'm going to cut out the funny parts. I'm going to stick with the meat. We need to learn to listen to God's Spirit. Sometimes we are just not paying attention. We're like the little kids. You know, I remember, I remember when I was young, mom would call us. We lived on 20 acres, so sometimes we couldn't hear mom, right? Oh, we didn't hear you, mom. I, I admit, I confess it right here. You know, sometimes we're, we're just not attentive to the Spirit and what He is saying and how He is leading. We need to learn to listen to Him. And that means, in part, when we're confronted with a tough decision, instead of working through it all of it in our heads first, let's first talk with God about it. Or when we're confronted with a temptation, rather than trying to rationalize, with, by the way, it doesn't work. If you start rationalizing a temptation, you're going to commit the sin. <laughs> instead, talk to God about it. But you need to be attentive to hear what He's saying if you're going to know that what you're doing is sin. <laughs> You need to be listening for what he is saying, listening to his still, small voice. Second of all, we are invited to talk to him. If you want to cultivate a fruitful life, you need to talk to God. Isn't it amazing that our God invites us into relationship with him, that he listens to us? Sadly, we are often too busy to talk. We're like the kids who go off and leave their parents behind, right? Go off to college and never talk to us anymore. Go to Japan. and No, Jacob's been good with communicating with his parents, but don't, don't be like that kid when it comes to your relationship with God. Talk to him every day. Set aside time every day. Make it priority every day because what is more important than talking to your heavenly father? And third, we need to obey him. This one may seem a little too obvious, but it must be said, especially in view of the tendency for us to treat sin like it's, it's no big deal or it's out of our control. Listen, now that we have the Spirit in us, there is never a temptation we face except that which is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let us be tempted beyond that which, by the power of the Spirit, we can say no to. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no fruitful life where sin is excused, ignored, or allowed to go on without repentance. So this is where a fruitful life begins. Intentional cultivation of listening to God, talking to God, and obeying God. Starting next Sunday, we're going to actually get to the first fruit of the Spirit. And it's a doozy. So I'm looking forward to it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for the richness of your word and the richness of the challenges that we find here. God, we want to be people who lead more fruitful lives. We desire that. So, Lord, be working inside of us. Be transforming us by your Spirit. Even this week, God, help us to be setting aside that time every day to be in your presence so we might keep growing in you 
conform more and more into your image, Jesus. Change us. We pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand for our benediction. Those of you who are interested in the trip to Marseille, France, the House of Hope, that's going to be meeting right after our service today, right? Where is that meeting? Uh, let's make that meeting in the fireside room since I hear no voices uh, coming. So in the fireside room, if you're interested in that. We conclude this morning with these words from the end of the book of Romans. And this is what Paul prays for the Roman church, and it's what I pray for our church today. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.